I know that's probably the last song you expected to hear in church today. Man, what's up, Victory family? How y'all doing? Fantastic. My name is Montel Jordan. I'm the worship pastor here at Victory World Church in North Cross, Georgia. I want to start out by saying, man, it is an honor and it's a privilege to be able to serve you today because that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to serve you. I'm especially excited today because we got a lot of young people, a lot of youth and young adults who came to be in the building today. And I'm saying this because in preparing this message and speaking with Pastor Dennis in regard to his heart uh, for our young people, uh, he had a, a burning desire to make sure that our future musicians and songwriters and recording artists and everything had an opportunity to hear this message and this truth that God wants to share with us uh, on this day. So if you are an energetic young person or if you're an old person that can fake it real good, can you let heaven hear you make some noise in this place? Hey, man, that's what I'm talking about. The past few weeks we've had, uh, uh, we've been in a series called Worship. And the beautiful thing is our, our Pastor Dennis has been walking us through and giving us information uh, and insight into what worship is, that worship is a lifestyle and that worship is, uh, uh, worship is so many, so many different things. And we even talked about how God is just, his heartbeat for us is to worship him. It's warfare in some areas and that he desires for us to worship him in spirit and in truth. And not only that, he desires us to worship him and love him with all of our heart and all of our mind, with all of our soul. And Pastor Colleen tag teamed in on the worship series and, and discussed with us how God desires for us to love him with all of our strength as well because God desires us, he loves us, he's affectionate for us, and he's zealous and jealous for us uh, as well. And even last week, as, as Pastor David Stevens touched on, uh, during the Easter services, I don't know if you know this, we had over pretty much nine services between here and our Hamilton Mill campus, and over those nine services, the course of that, we had over 1,700 people who made a conscious decision to recommit themselves to making Jesus the center of their lives. That's huge. That's big, and that all leads us to today, which is the final message in the series on worship, and the message today is called The Power of Music. Can you say that with me? The Power of Music. I don't know if you know this, but music has power. It has more power than we think, and I also know and I believe that Music is a gift from God, and some of us don't know that, that music is a gift from God that he's given to us. And so today, I want to ask that we take a moment as we prepare to go into prayer, because I want us to hear what God's heart is, what God says about music, the gift that he's given us, and how he desires to be glorified in that gift. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes in a word of prayer. God, we come before you right now, and we love you, and we know that you hear us. We know you hear us because we're coming to you on behalf of of your son Jesus, the name above all names. God, I humble myself in your presence today, God, just asking that you would be exalted. And my simple prayer request today, God, would be that you make me invisible. Just make me completely obsolete, Father, so that what your people hear are your words, and what they see is your truth, and what they feel is your heart. Allow your word to come alive today in your people, God, and that my life would simply be transparent and usable for your service today. And we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. That's what's up. You know, um, we're just going to get right into it. Uh, there are three things that I think we should all know about music. I'm going to share with you three things that we should all know about music. Now, this first one's not going to be a big, you know, aha moment, but um, the number one is music has power. Music has power. And I know you're saying, well, I guess in a series called The Power of Music, you know, duh, music has power. But I'm going to share with you an example as to why I know music has power. When I was a kid growing up in Los Angeles, California, I was addicted. I was addicted to Saturday morning cartoons. This is true. And I'm talking about this is back when cartoons were real cartoons, not a lot of, you know, what's out there now. 
But as I was growing up, me and my brother, we would get up on Saturday mornings early and I'd have my little pajamas with the feet in them. And I was still tall as a kid, so like my toes would start to pop out the bottom of them and stuff. But we would get our bowls of cereal and we would sit in front of the TV and for hours on a Saturday morning watch cartoons. And during this time as a child, there was something that would come on while the cartoons would be on that was called Schoolhouse Rock. Now, oh, okay. It's, it's some old school in the building, too. Okay, that's what's up. Yeah, and if you don't know what Schoolhouse Rock is, let me, let me school you. Schoolhouse Rock were these animated, educational mini commercials that were set to music. And what they did was they took information and messages and they put them in song form and cartoon form for kids. I mean, it was stuff on math and history and grammar, and they took it and they put it in a musical form and they gave it to the kids. One of these I remember, there was this, there was this document that was rolled up and they was talking about how laws are made, right? And it, and it went like this. It said, I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Oh. Hey, old school in the building. Geritol Depends party after service. That's what's up. You know what? Another one of my favorites was one called the preamble. I don't know if you know what the preamble is, but when our founding fathers were founding this great nation of America, and they put together the Constitution of the United States, there's an introductory piece of the Constitution. And what Schoolhouse Rock did is what they took that piece of information and they put it to music, the power of music, and this is what that sounded like. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, Provide for the common defense, support the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity to ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Now listen. Now, now check this out. The reason why I sang that for you and the reason why this is even relevant to today's conversation is this. That was created in the early 70s. The song I just sang for you is almost 40 years old. The power of music, almost 40 years old. And if you're not grabbing what I'm saying there, what I'm saying to you is that something that I listened to as a child repetitively, repetitiously, over and over again, I was able to recite back to you word for word almost 40 years later because it is ingrained in my cerebellum. It is burnt into my mental Rolodex that I could repeat back a piece of American history that I have never touched or seen. The power of music. What that says to me is that that which I learned, that information, that message is now a part of me. It's a part of who I am. And some of you may be saying, well, I mean, come on, Mons. I mean, it's just music. These are just songs. Well, let me ask you this question, and I'm not asking this for a response right now, but what information are you allowing to become a part of you? A, a better question is, is what songs are attaching themselves to you? What messages are connecting themselves to your spirit? What does your musical DNA look like? What will you recite? What will you repeat 10, 20, 30 years from now? The best way I can ask this question today, the God that lives in you, what are you forcing him to listen to? Now, see, this is important. And this is important to me specifically because God has been holding me accountable because of the life I led and the things I've done, the music that I've, I've created. He's holding me accountable and responsible to tell you some truths today. And at some point today, you'll probably be faced with the decision to hear the truth. Now, you're going to hear the truth in love because you can hear the truth. And if it's not given to you in love, you probably won't receive it. But I'm going to give you the truth today in love. And the position that you'll be in will be to either accept that truth or reject that truth. So what we're saying today is point number one, there is power in music. And anybody that knows anything about music also knows, or I should say, if you know anything about power, power has to have a source. And so we're going to discuss now what that source of power is, and that's point number two. Music is a gift from God. Music 
is a gift from God. Now, I understand this is a point that could be considered debatable. I mean, I've heard people all the time, you know, say, well, there's God music and there's the devil's music and there's Christian music and there's secular music. And here, I want to shatter a myth for you today. Listen to this. God is the source. God is the creator. The enemy can't create anything. The enemy cannot create anything anything. Only God can create. Now, the enemy can recreate something, or he can twist something, or he can duplicate something, or he can pervert something, but as far as creating something, it only can come from God. Music is a gift from God given to us. And watch this. When we take the gift that he's given us and we give it back to him, that is what we call a form of worship. But actually, God has given music to us as a gift. Take a look at this scripture, 1 Samuel 16 and 23, and it says, Whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take up his lyre and he would play, and relief would come to Saul, and he would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. If you're familiar with this story, you'll know that King Saul was a kind of an evil king placed over the people, and these tormenting spirits would come over King Saul, and he did not go before God and raise his hand and say, Lord, remove this from me. What he did was he called for David, and David would come in with this huge harp, and David would use his hands and begin to play the music, and as he played the music, the music would soothe the king, and the evil spirit would leave him, and he would feel better. Have you ever sought comfort in a song before? Is there a song that you've ever played that made you feel good? Or perhaps you were in a depressed place and you, you played a song to help you feel more depressed? <laughs> the reason that is is because music is a gift that God gave to us to use and to enjoy for all different seasons of our lives. It's a gift that he's given to us. Now, I'm going to challenge you here with your thinking a little bit because, like I said, some people think music is good or evil, it's this or that, but we're discussing that God is the creator. The enemy seeks to pervert what God has created. I'm going to submit to you today that music is neither good or evil, but that, that music is just a gift from God. And let me give you an example. Just say, I have this pen here, and I love this pen, but this pen right now is going to be a gift from me to you. This is now your pen. It is a gift that I give to you. Now you can take this gift that I have given you. You can take this pen and you can use it to write beautiful things. You can use it to write blessings. You can use it to do fantastic things in the world. You can use it to write checks. That's a good thing. You could also take this pen and you could use it to write bad things. You can write it to curse people. You can use it to write horrible things. You can use this pen to do demeaning things or write tabloid stuff. Those are all the things you could do with this pen. Now check this out and follow me here. This pen can make blessings. This pen can make cursings. But this pen itself is not good or evil. The pen is simply a gift. Now follow me here. Let me go another further. Just take, for example, uh, when God gives someone the gift of athleticism. You got somebody that got the gift of being able to run really, really fast, all right? Now, now that person is able to take that gift and be like maybe Tim Tebow and be uh, uh, honor God in, in, the, in the NFL or do something in the NBA or that gift can be used to run in the Olympics. It can be used to take the gift that God gives and can glorify God. Or that gift of being able to run really fast could be used to run from the police. But here's the point. The gift of athleticism itself can be a blessing, it can be a curse, but the gift itself is neither good or evil. It's what's done with the gift that determines whether God is going to be glorified or whether something else is going to be glorified. Music is a gift. It is a powerful gift. What we do with it is what determines whether God is glorified or whether something else is glorified. God is the creator. He's the only one that can create. The enemy is an imitator. Take a look at Romans 11 and 29. It's in your notes. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Another translation of that is, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He doesn't take that gift back. He gave us the gift of music. And I believe that when we use the gift of music for his glory, he is that. He is glorified. What father doesn't want a glory in a gift that he would give to his children? Music has power. The gift of music is a gift from God. 
And that leads us to our third point. And this is going to be a little tougher here, but the third point is the music we listen to determines who we serve. The music we listen to determines who we serve. Now, that's a tough one for some of you because you may be saying to yourself, I mean, come on, man. What do you mean who we serve? I mean, it's a song. It can't make you do nothing. It can't influence you. To, I mean, it's just a song. What's the big deal? Well, I enjoy music. A lot of you enjoy music. I believe music is the soundtrack to our lives. When I say music is the soundtrack to our lives, here's what I mean. Terminology, when I was in the music business, the term soundtrack referred to if there was a movie or a film or something that they scored music or they put music into it so that it determined the tone of something or the mood of something or the atmosphere of something. The music combined together made it the soundtrack. So, for example, in your life, Anything that determines the tone of what's going on in your life or the mood of what's happening or the atmosphere of what's happening in your life, that is the soundtrack to your life. I can tell you right now, if you think back to some of the best times in your life, the happiest time, the most fruitful times in your life, maybe you were a young person, young and dumb and in love, and you was on the phone late at night, and you was woo-woo-wooing all on the phone, or, or maybe it was when you got proposed to, or maybe it was your wedding day, or maybe it was an anniversary, maybe it was a spring break. I don't know what it may have been, but if you think back to one of the best times or some of the best times in your life, chances are, there's a song attached to that memory. There's music that's attached there. I can remember when my wife and I got married, our first song that we danced to was by a group called After Seven. Ready or not, I give you everything. That was my jam. <laughs> and you probably have one of those too in your life. Now, the flip side of that coin is, if you were to think back to the worst times in your life, if you go back and think about those times where you may have been depressed, where something bad happened to you, where you were struggling, perhaps you had a divorce, perhaps you had a death, perhaps something tragic happened in your life. Chances are there is music attached to that memory because music is the soundtrack to our lives. You can go back and that music takes you right back to what was happening in your life at that time. I can remember I had a fraternity brother of mine many, many years ago who took his own life. And after that, when we had the memorial service as opposed to uh, thinking about the death and how he left this earth, uh, we rather, we, they, the family decided to focus on his life, and they played a song from the Sounds of Blackness. As long as you keep your head to the sky. And what happened is I was driving here in Atlanta just about two days ago, and that song came on the radio, and immediately it dropped me back 25 years ago to what I felt at that time, what was going on in my life, the memories, the missing, all of that, because there's power in music to do that. Man, those moments are crazy. And one thing that we know, one thing we could agree on is that that music attaches itself to good and bad times in our life. What we don't really know is that that music that's attaching itself to our lives has spiritual influence. This is what we don't understand, that there is a spiritual influence connected to the music. Well, Monte, what do you mean spiritual influence? Well, we know that God is a spirit. We know we worship him in spirit and truth. He desires our love, our affections. But this is something that Pastor Dennis touched on a couple of weeks ago as he was discussing uh, an angel that God created by the name of Lucifer. Uh, he was in heaven. He was actually a very gifted angel. God gave him a whole lot of gifts that he didn't actually give to other angels. As a matter of fact, it's said in Ezekiel and Isaiah, as you get a glimpse into Lucifer's life, he had more wings than some of the other angels. He had the ability to be musical. As a matter of fact, he was a walking, talking instrument. He literally had musical instruments built into his body, jewels and things like that. They said that he was this beautiful, beautiful angel, and he was over the worship in heaven. His job was designated to leading all the other angels in worship and in exalting God. And then one day he gets this notion that he wants to exalt himself above God, and this is where he ends up making his fall, where he loses his position. He loses his position as head over worship in heaven. That's a job, man, and he got fired from his job. But look, he's pretty persuasive because when he takes his fall from heaven, he takes a third of heaven's angels with him. That's persuasive. That's like you getting fired from your job and a third of the whole company says, yeah, we leaving too. We up out of here. <laughs> a third of heaven comes along with him. That's persuasive. 
So Lucifer becomes Satan. He falls into the earth. And the incredible thing about this is as he gets his foothold in the earth to become a ruler in principalities and, and high places, and he gets his, his stronghold in the earth, he lost his position as head over worship in heaven. He lost his position, but he never lost his gift. Oh, no, he didn't lose his gift because God gives gifts without repentance. It's irrevocable. He never lost his gift. And so when he gets here into the earth, he lost his position, but he never lost his job description. So as head over music, head over worship in heaven, he now becomes head over music and worship in the earth. And not only that, he's persuasive. So all those that are coming along with him, this is why when you listen to music, there are certain things that pull on you and influence you, and it's hard to break because the same influence, the same jewels, and the same beauty that are all encompassed and who Lucifer was in heaven is who he is here on the earth, and that's the draw that we have. So when you say, well, Monta, what's the big deal? Man, come on, it's just a song. It's just music, right? Well, I ask you this. When you look at this, it seems like there's a war going on, a war for your affection, a war for your worship where God is saying, I want to give you spiritual things and I want you to enjoy me in this place with the gift of music that I give you. And now the enemy who's positioned himself here that says, well, I want you to either worship me or at least don't worship God. Meaning, you don't have to just worship me, but if I can even distract you from not worshiping God, that's a win for me and I'm cool with that. And what happens is we've got these spiritual influences now. God wants to influence you spiritually so that you want to lift your hands and you want to praise and you want to worship and, and joy and peace and healing. And the enemy who is anti-God and who is anti-Christ has a desire for you not to feel joy and peace and all these different things. And this is where this war is being waged here on the earth. And music becomes a battleground for what's happening here. Are you following me so far? Very good. Okay, so this, this musical battleground that's going on here and spiritual influences now attach themselves to the music. Well, what do you mean? God's music, like what we heard today with the worship team, there's a spiritual influence that may make you want to raise your hands, may make you want to do whatever because it's uh, influencing you and it's affecting your spirit. Now, on the other hand, if you go back and you pull out Dr. Dre's Chronic album, there is a drug influence on the music. Or if you go and you pull up an old Montel Jordan record, there is an alcohol and party influence on the music. If you go and you pull up an old Public Enemy or a Marvin Gaye album, there is political influence on the music. You pull up NWA Ice Cube, there is gangster mentality influence. On, are, you, are you picking up what I'm putting down here? There are spiritual influences that attach themselves to the music that is attached to your life soundtrack. And those whole things are in a battle over who and what you're going to worship while you're here on this earth. So, being that we're in a battle that we don't even understand that we're in, the question then becomes this. What is the biggest tool that is used in that battle, in that war within music and spirituality? Well, that tool, that weapon is called songs. Songs are the weapons that are used in music to fight and to battle in this warfare for music. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to share with you three things that we should all know about songs. Three things we should all know about songs because songs are the way we express music. And a lot of people don't know, but songs are normally comprised of three things. Songs are comprised of a melody. Songs are comprised of rhythm. And songs are comprised of lyrics. Melody, rhythm, Lyrics. Most songs will have all three of those elements in the song. So let's go ahead and let's discuss this. The first thing we should all know about a song deals with the melody or the tune of a song. Most people who enjoy listening to music are completely oblivious and unaware that when you listen to a song, the melody of that song affects your emotions. The melody of a song affects your emotions. Well, what do you mean, Montel? Well, let me give you an example. Back when I was a kid, I used to watch this TV show that would come on called The Incredible Hulk. And on this show, it's old school, uh, uh, The Incredible Hulk, there would be this guy, David Bruce Banner, and you don't want to make him angry because you wouldn't like him when he's angry, and he would get angry. He'd turn into the Hulk and tear up the city, and at the end of the show, you see this dude walking all by himself, 
lonely road all by himself. And this music would come in. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. And I would think to myself as a kid, man, I feel so sad. <laughs> Poor lonely guy. He can't catch a break. But that music made me feel sad. Or maybe you're not that old school, so take a look at something like um, uh, the, the Young and the Restless, right? The TV show Young and the Restless. When that show comes on, you hear this. Bing! Bang, 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 bang! Bang, 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 bang! Bing, bing! Bing, bing! Doesn't that make you feel young and restless? That song makes me feel young and restless. Some of you have been watching that show so long, you are the not so young and restless. Let me give you another example. Man, it does not matter. I, I go back and I watch the movie Rocky, and every time that music, dun 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 Man, watch how you run up on me after service, I'm telling you, because I'm, I'm feeling real pumped right now. Here's the point. Whether a song makes you feel sad, whether it makes you feel young or restless, whether it makes you feel so pumped, any song, any song that makes or influences the way you feel, it has power over you. Any song that influences the way you feel, it has power over you. Now, that's, that influence is a spiritual influence that can either glorify God or it can glorify the enemy. Second thing you need to know about songs deals with the rhythm, the rhythm of a song. The rhythm of a song is the beat of a song. And a lot of people are completely unaware, they are oblivious, that when you are listening to the rhythm of a song or the beat of a song, that rhythm or beat affects your will your will. What do you mean by will, Montel? Well, when I say it affects your will, it affects your call to action. It affects you wanting to act or to, uh, to react, to behave a certain way, to move a certain way. It calls you in, into action. I don't know how many times, I'm sure I don't have to stay on this for a long time. Many of us have cut on the radio and you heard a song that came on the radio and you thought to yourself, man, this is garbage. How did this song get on the radio? What three-year-old wrote this song? No disrespect to three-year-olds. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we've heard a song, and it's just been like, ah, what is this? And then after you listen to it a couple more times, what happens? It starts to grow on you. That's right. Ah, it starts to grow on you. That's because the rhythm or the beat of the song starts to affect your will and your action and your behavior towards the song. Let me give you an example. Back in the day, a couple of years ago, a, a famous producer, Dr. Dre, did a joint for 50 Cent. You young people understand this. There was a song in the, called In the Club. Bum, bum, ch, bum, bum, ch, bum, bum, ch, bum, bum. And let me tell you something. When you hear me even sing just those beats, I'm not singing words. I'm not giving you a lot of melody. I'm giving you a beat. As you hear that beat, something starts to happen <laughs> to you because the beat or the rhythm is starting to affect your will. I think about Eminem. I think about the Eight Mile soundtrack and the song Lose Yourself. And that song comes along. Dun, 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 dun. Look at my face. Dun, 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 dun. I can't smile and do that. I have to frown. Dun, 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 dun. And why? It's because the beat and the rhythm is affecting 
affecting my will. And when it affects your will, your action, your behavior, when this sermon first started and we went into it and they played the This Is How We Do It song and it said, this is a... Some of y'all almost backslid right then. You just... Why is that? It's because the rhythm of a song, the beat of a song affects your will, your movement into action, your behavior. It pulls you in. It draws you in. It compels you. And here's what you need to know about that. Any song that you listen to that affects your will, that influences your will to act or behave a certain way, it has power over you. Now, that spiritual influence that's attached to that song, it may be a beat or whatever, make you want to stand up and worship in the church and give God glory, or it can be a beat or rhythm that makes you not honor God and honor something else. The third thing about songs, lyrics. Most people do not know that the lyrics of a song are what affect your mind. The lyrics are words of a song. They affect your mind. They affect your way of thinking. And I got to tell you guys, I've been fasting all week, and I've been asking people specifically to pray for me in delivering this part of the message to you because, uh, uh, because I love you, and I'm sharing this information with you. This is going to probably hurt. I'm telling you the truth in love because some of the things I'm going to say right now will probably hurt. But God wants you to hear this. He wants you to know his heart for music. When we talk about these lyrics, or we talk about these words, this is, this is crazy simply because the lyrics of a song are more important than we could ever even, even comprehend. And one of the things that we do is we allow our musical icons and celebrities to minister to us. They become ministers to us. A lot of people don't know this, but you don't have to be in church to be a minister of music. You can be a minister of music in the world. I know this because that's what I was. I was a minister of music in the world. I could tell you what we're going to do on a Friday night and how we're going to feel all right. I could tell you what this was going to happen. And when we got up in the club, I could tell you about lifting your hands up and waving them from here to there. And people allowed me to minister to them. Made some feel good. It did a lot of different things. Now, understand, I have to be accountable for the things that I said and the things that I did. And yet and still, I was ministering to many of you. I, I would even go so far as to say this. I was your minister, a lot of you, I was your minister of music in the world before I was your worship pastor in the church. So here's the question. Who's your minister of music? Who is your minister of music? Well, let's examine that. All the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies, put your hands up. That's your minister of music. Beyonce is your minister of music. A lot of you don't want to accept that she is your minister of music, and Beyonce may not want to accept the responsibility of being your minister of music, but she is. Because the ministry that she gives you when you are up in the club and you're doing your own little thing and telling you to put a ring on it, she put a ring on it, you are ingesting those messages into your spirit. And as you take those messages into your spirit, she is ministering to you. It'll change the way you dress when you go out, the way you behave, the, your swagger, all of those different things. Because of that music and because of that message, it will compel you to act a certain way. We got so many sexually confused teenagers. We got sexually confused adults because they listen to their minister of music, Katy Perry, and she says, I kissed a girl and I like it. And then we wonder why we can't find ourselves in one. Maybe I was born this way or trying to figure out, you know, all these different things as to why we can't find the purpose that God has for us. And literally, it's because we're ingesting 
ministry into us that's determining who we are. Now understand, I am not coming against the Beyonce's and the Katy Perry's. God, That's not what I'm doing. What I'm saying to you is that there is an underlying war and music is the battleground and these songs are used as weapons and those toting the weapons, not even knowing they're in a battle, maybe not knowing, are delivering this warfare to us. Man, this is tough. Because I, you know, I like Lil Wayne. Wayne is nice, nice MC. But there's so much promiscuity in our young people in, in having sex at such young ages and involved in things they don't need to be. And I go and you look at him, and he's some of you, some of our music minister. For some of us, he's your music minister. And when he's saying to you, lick it like a lollipop, lick it like a lollipop, lick it like a lollipop, here's what's happening. You're ingesting and you're repeating repetitively an information and a message over and over again, just like I did 40 years ago that I could say over and over again. And 40 years later, word for word, it's become a part of me. And that, for many of you in here, is going to be what you will repeat 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Oh. And then look, this is, this is how the perfect storm happens here. The perfect storm happens when you got that song and then the melody, man, it just makes you feel that right feeling to you. And the beat, the rhythm of that joint, whoo, man, it just, it affects your will and it affects the way that you act and the way you behave. And then the lyrics of it, they're just right. Those words hit you in a spot that just deals with just what you're dealing with at that time. And, it affects your mind and it affects the way that you think. And the word of God says, whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And here's what happens. We go into this place of worship. And that's what we do all week long. We think it's just music, right? It's just a song. No. All week long, you are worshiping all week long and this is why i know this because on a weekend there's your worship team not just here but in churches all over america all over the world the worship team is preparing to set an atmosphere where god is here ready for you to enter the presence of god and we get about 20 minutes every weekend we get just just about 20 minutes 15, depending on whether you get here on time or not and, and, and getting into the building and everything, but we get about 15 to 20 minutes. That's what we get, 15 to 20 minutes to try and grab you and bring you into the presence of God. Some of you, we got to drag you kicking and screaming and some of you hands in the pockets and some standing and issues and difficult, and we got to bring some of you, drag you into the presence of God to try and drag you into the presence of God, just for an experience with God, just for an encounter with God, so we can try to counter what your other worship pastor has been feeding you all week long. Your worship pastors are feeding you this stuff all week long. It's hard to combat that. Here's the point. Any song that causes you or influences you to think a certain way, it has power over you. Now, we've discussed music and three things about music that you need to know, and we've discussed three things about songs that you need to know. I want to go right now and, and discuss, since we touched on worship, I'd like to discuss three things about worship that you should know. Three things about worship that we all should know. Number one, worship is a lifestyle. I mean, you, you've, you've seen it on the t-shirt. On the you've seen the slogan. Pastor Dennis talked about it. Worship is a lifestyle. Let me give you an understanding what that means. Worship being a lifestyle means this. Without music and without a song, what you do in your regular everyday life, the way you speak to your spouse, is worship. The way you love and you raise your children, that is worship. The way you honor your job and you get there on time and you use that job and you bless it as though you were working unto God, 
that is worship. When you forgive those that don't deserve forgiving, that is worship. When you pray for those that curse you and you bless those that hate you and look for your downfall, that is worship. And that's what we're supposed to be doing every day of our lives throughout the week. And by doing that, God desires for us to have music and to enjoy music that accompanies and becomes the soundtrack to that lifestyle. That's the first thing you need to know about worship. The second thing you need to know about worship, we praise God because of what he's done, but we worship God because of who he is. We praise him for what he's done. We worship him for who he is. Now, a lot of people get this one wrong because they hear, oh, we're about to have a time of praise and worship, about to have a time of praise and worship, and we say praise and worship as though it's one word. It's not one word. Several words, and they mean different things. Some people think praise is the fast songs and worship is the slow songs. <laughs> That's not the case. Here's praise and worship. We praise God in response to what he does. You worship God in response to who he is. Praise him in response to what he's done. We worship him in response to who he is. Well, what does that mean? Well, I can tell you a lot of us have come from, you know, myself personally, I came from a background, of one of those church backgrounds where, you know, you, you know we praise him. We, you know, we're going to you know, run around the church three times and you'll run out of your situation. You know, jump up and down two times and you're going to jump into your destiny. And, you know, that's what I was taught. I was trained that way. And a lot of times because of oppression or because of cultural differences, a lot of urban folks have had some oppressions and we're taught more about praising, you know, because when God does something for you, we praise him and thank him for what he's done. But here's the point. If God didn't do it yet and he didn't heal it yet and he didn't fix it yet and he didn't do anything yet, he still is God and he still <laughs> desires our worship. Are you following this? We praise him for what he's done. We worship him for who he is. And the third thing we need to know about worship, and this is probably the most important, worship is not for us. It's not for me. It's not for you. Worship is for God. Amen. Worship is not for you. Worship <laughs> is not for you. Worship, it's not for you. God gave us the gift of music. He gave that gift to us. That's for us. He wants you to be able to be trustworthy with music that he gives to you. He wants you to hear jazz music and beautiful things that he created. It's a gift. He gave that to us. When we give that gift back to him, that's our form of worship when we give that back to him. But it's to him. Worship goes to him, not to us. I cannot tell you how many times we've had a situation where folks have come to church and this, you know, I don't know if I, you know, if I feel that song. Or I don't know if I feel, when they're going to do some Kirk Franklin up in there and, you know, they got on them rock guitars and this, and I don't feel that. I don't feel that in my spirit. You know, you'll leave a church because the worship doesn't cater to the way that you like to worship. And it's not about you. Worship is not for you. It's for God. If we change that one mindset, it would change our entire services all over this nation because worship is not for us. Let me tell you, my, my wife's grandparents, they're both passed away now. They were uh, uh, ministers in the Salvation Army. And I didn't know the Salvation Army is actually a real army. And I went to their worship service on a weekend, and I rolled up into the Salvation Army church, and they had a tuba and an accordion and they were going hard after Jesus <laughs> I'm not joking red suits had I mean going hard after Jesus with a tuba and an accordion here's my point if we are living a lifestyle of worship throughout the entire week 
you would be able to come in here on a Saturday and Sunday and walk into this building and they could have cleared this stage and there'll be no instruments here and we could just walk in and we could lift up our hands and we could lift up our voices and we will begin to exalt the King of Kings, the creator of the universe. And you know what? It wouldn't be no problem tapping in. It would be just like flicking a light switch because you've been connected to the source all week long. Man, I tell you, the scripture we've been kind of focusing on during this entire worship uh, series has been from Mark 12 and 30. And it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And if you're not picking up what that scripture is saying, all does not mean some. All means all. All means everything. It's hard to love God with your all when you love something else. I know this personally. I used to say, man, I love music. I don't know what I'd do without music. I love music. You know what? Music can never love me back. Music can't love you back. My wife, she can love me back. My children, my family, people, they can love me back. Music, it cannot love you back. It's one of the main reasons why I left the music industry and I went into full-time ministry. There's a lot of reasons, but that was a main one. And when I think about this, I'm going to share just a, a glimpse into my life, just a real transparent moment with you. Is one of the reasons why I unashamedly stand before God now and I go hard after God. When I worship in the street where I don't care, Facebook, I'm a Twitter evangelist, I go hard after God, letting folks know that I love Jesus. And the reason why I go so hard after God is because when I was in the world, I went hard after the world. And I can't come into the body of Christ and not go as hard for God as I went when I was in the world. So I go hard after God now. And I do that because I know personally that I should be dead. I know I should be dead. Some of you out there have had experiences in your life and you know you should be dead. You should not be alive. Something you were in, something God pulled you out of, a pathway you were on, something and you know that you should be dead. I can tell you, I, I went back to when I was on tour with Boys to Men back in 1995 and there was a stage a little bit higher than this and I fell off the back of a stage with my hands in my ears. I fell back on my head and I know that I should be dead. I can think about some of the things I did in my marriage, outside of my marriage, in promiscuity and, and I know that from those situations that I should be dead. I can tell you about a time uh, in the recording studio in Los Angeles, California, where some robbers ran up into the place and found out some of them were murderers, and they came in, robbed the studio that I normally recorded in. For whatever reason, two days before that, I switched recording studios, and they came in, robbed the place, and asked for me by name. I know that I should be dead. I know I got so many I should be dead examples that I could give you, but the point is they're all irrelevant stories because I'm not dead and because I'm alive, and I'm alive because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus that I'm alive. I'm alive. And Jesus captured my heart. And the God Father made me an offer that I could not refuse. And I tell you, you never know you need a Savior until you need saving. God allowed me to have this musical testimony to just kind of show the world that I got more in him now than I ever had when I was in the world. But I walked down this road. And as I think back on this road to people that I knew, people that I worked with, and I, I just think about people like, you know, like Biggie and, and Tupac or Michael Jackson, Don Cornelius, Whitney Houston, some I knew, some that I worked with. And I think back on these lives. I know where this road leads. I know where the road leads. And, and uh, Pastor Johnson Bowie told me, he gave me license to be able to say this. Um, if you want to know what lies down the road ahead, ask somebody who's on the way back. There's a scripture, Exodus 20 and 3. 
I'll actually get there in, in just a second, but I think what God wants to know today is because I know person I know why I know why we love music so much and I know why it's hard to let music go and it's because God gave us this gift of music and I think what God is asking us today what he's asking you today is do you love the gift or do you love the gift giver do you love the gift or do you love the gift giver I'm sorry, Exodus 20 and 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, I am a jealous God. Amen. Now for many of you hearing this message today, music, is your idol and you know it and God knows it the only reason I know it is because I was there and I made music my idol and I recognized the symptoms and so here's where we're going with this I mean you can be saved this is not a, a unsaved saved thing you be saved and you struggle with this it's persuasive it draws you in so at the end of this service, there are going to be ministers here who will be ready to minister to you. If indeed you don't know the Lord and you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, we want to provide that to you and welcome you into that family. But the prayer that we're about to pray in just a moment is a different prayer. It's a prayer of conviction. And what that conviction is going to do for you is that understand I mean, catch this. I, I'm not that dude that's going to try and ask you, okay, you need to go out and burn up all your CDs and crack them up and break them and give them away and all. That's not me. That might be Johnson Bowie. He might tell you to you know, crack them CDs up. I don't know, but I, that's not me. This is, I, I don't want you to put a, a Band-Aid on a stab wound. I don't want to get rid of the symptom. And, and understand this. Some of you probably do need to burn up and crack up and delete some of the stuff that you're listening to. But... I don't want to get rid of the symptom. I want to get down to the problem. I want to get to the root of the problem. And what's going to happen is, in a moment, if you will agree to say this prayer, if you're courageous enough to say this prayer, I can promise you that it will change your life forever. God gave me that to give to you and tell you, if you say this prayer, it will change your life forever. Because look, here's what a prayer of conviction does. Getting saved that is the starting point. It's not the ending part for Christians. Getting saved, that's the starting line. Now it's about getting delivered from things as you're running this race. And this is one of the things that we need to get delivered from. And what conviction does, this prayer for conviction, it says, God, I know you love me, and I know you've given me the gift of music, and I want to be trustworthy with the gift that you've given me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to trust you to be God, and I'm going to give the gift back to you. And I'm going to ask you that any time I am compromising the God that is inside of you, that you'll let me know you don't need to listen to that. Turn that. Don't look at that. Don't, you know, you, hey, this is hurting me. This is grieving my spirit. Don't, we don't have to listen to that. He wants you to listen to jazz. He wants you to listen to certain things. I think he wants to bless you. It's a gift from him. He wants to bless you with it, but he's got to be able to trust you with that gift. And what this gift of conviction will do is when you leave here today and you hop up in your car and you drive home and you cut the radio on, what will happen is by you inviting God and inviting the Holy Spirit to have access to that part of your life, he'll simply just say, hey, Please, I don't, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. And even as I'm giving you this message, I know some of you out there are still holding on. You're saying, you know what, cool, thanks, you know, we appreciate the information, but I, I just love my this, I love my that. I, I can't let that go or this or that. And let me share something with you. This might, this might hit you like a brick, but here, some of these things that you are holding on to that you feel like you can't let go of, listen to this. If God give you the strength to let go of that, you're going to find out that it was actually holding on to you all along. It wasn't even you holding on to it. It had the strong hold on you. So I'm going to ask you in just a moment 
if you will be courageous. If not, it's okay. You can just bow your head anyway. But if you're courageous and you want a change, a life change, will you bow your heads and repeat this prayer? Jesus, I know you love me. I know you want to bless me. You've given me the gift of music. You want me to have it. You want to trust me with it. So I give it back to you. And I ask you to have full access to what I listen to, what I take into my spirit, what I allow to be a part of me. Convict me. Holy Spirit, convict me in love so that I know I belong to you. Now let's just lift our hands towards heaven. For some of you that said that, I want you to receive that the Holy Spirit will function within you and he's going to let you know the stuff that honors him and that serves God and the things that do not. And listen, I want you to know, you can put your hands down. What I want you to know about this is that when you're taking that drive or you're in a restaurant or whenever that music hits you, when you do feel that tap, every time a song comes on that's not supposed to be putting something in you and you feel that tap, I want you to know that is a confirmation. It's a confirmation from God saying to you, I love you and you belong to me. And that's the only reason I don't want you to listen to that because I want you to keep drawing closer to me. Now, as we get ready to close, I'm going to leave you with something during the time when I was transitioning uh, from the world of music into the world of ministry. This was a song uh, that ministered to me. And so I'm going to ask you just to have a moment of personal reflection. You can be sitting, you can stand, you can be on your knees and just time between you and God to understand that what he wants to do in this gift of music is be a blessing to you. So in just a moment, we're just going to have this time of reflection.
I put before my God is an idol. And anything I want with all my heart is an idol. Anything I can't stop thinking of is an idol. And anything that I give all my love, it is an idol. We must not worship something that's not even worth it. Clear the stage, make some space for the one who deserves it. Cause I can, I can sing all I want to. Yes, I can. I can sing all I want to. I can sing all I want to and still get it wrong. Oh, I, I, you can, you can sing all you want to, yes you can, you can sing all you want to, you can sing all you want to, and don't get me wrong, worship is more.